Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to day two of our Perio Africa conference. And kicking off this morning, we have a remote presentation from Abelardo Pardo, who is talking to us about OnTask. And this is a relatively new Perio project, um, and it's emerged from a very interesting group of universities that um, have tackled this as a research project, and it's made its way through the incubation process, and now has a uh, community forming around it, um, including hopefully UCT because it's on our list of projects, in fact, to pilot later this year. So uh, thank you very much, Abelardo, for sparing your time to present remotely to us at a time that is, well, it's not too bad for you, but it's not working hours exactly, and I believe you're also on holiday, is that right? Right, so um, over to, uh, we don't have sound, Sam. Sorry, Abelardo, we're just hooking up the sound to the projector sound. Okay. Perfect. Perfect, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. I hope that uh, you guys can hear me perfectly. If not, um, I'll be checking the, the chat window for communication because I have your audio muted. Well, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of uh, making this presentation. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be able to talk to a community of uh, people involved in education for such a, uh, from such a remote location. But it's also a sort of privilege to take advantage of technology to be able to just have this conversation about on task and the use of data to, to provide student support actions. Before I start my talk, let me just make sure I yeah. I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of where I'm from or, or what am I working on. Um, Although my affiliation is the University of South Australia, as you can see there, we do have this uh, laboratory within the institution called the Center for Change and Complexity in Learning. The center is directed by Professor George Siemens, or I should say co-directed by Professor uh, George Siemens and Shane Dawson. And the purpose of our laboratory is in general to explore how humans and artificial cognition understand each other and to try to understand also, also how knowledge processes are unfolding and their impact in society. But we also try to seek for a very practical application and impact, and this is perhaps the connection with on task. I also want to take this opportunity to just bring everybody on the same page and, and show you the connection between this initiative and what I uh, 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 a Clario learning analytic strategic vision. Out of all these elements in there, the one you see at the bottom that says anal analysis results and action is the one actually where we are trying to focus. And the reason we want to focus on there is because we have the sense that not enough is being done at that part of the overall vision. We have quite a lot of um, efforts and quite a lot of research initiatives in the areas of uh, uh, predictive models or data mining techniques. But we feel there is a little bit of mis misconnection between um, what we have in one side, which is we're getting excited because there is a lot of data about the education, but on the other side, learning analytics. And I think that the, the main reason for this project was to, to establish a much more direct and strong connection from the practitioner's point of view and provide uh, not so much a path for convoluted and sophisticated use of predictive models, but more about how can we better support the students using data. And the reason why we did that is because the context of uh, supporting the students is nothing new. It's, it's not a new idea. It's something that we've been doing for since we started um, in education. But the main challenge right now is that sometimes this is very uh, difficult due to the size of the student cohorts. In other words, we have more and more cases and, and more frequent courses in which the number of the students is so high that we cannot adequately provide them personalized support. So the idea is to kind of like align these two uh, objectives. See if we can find something where the data contributes directly to uh, benefit the students a bit more explicitly, but at the same time see if feedback is one of the vehicles that can benefit from that duality. We do have some initiatives already going on, and some of them are based around the idea of dashboards. And this is no surprise because when you start thinking or, or you start exploring 
uh, how data can be used for something a bit more precise, you basically rely on what happens in other fields. And in other fields, there is this tendency or there is this tradition or, or uh, should, should we say inertia to take a lot of data, put it into something that we call dashboards, and then go from there. What we are finding, and this is a bit of my personal view, is that these da dashboards are not that ideal for education. When you give the dashboards to students, they say, well, yeah, OK, fine. But uh, when you talk to the instructors, they tell you that what they need is something a bit more substantial than just flicking in front of them some uh, graphics and some colors about what happened in the, in the learning environment. If you think of it, dashboards also have a lot of information. They are supposed to be very it's supposed to be very useful in a specific context, but it don't work so well. At least that hasn't been or has been our experience in, in, in our pilots that the dashboards only take you so far, especially when you show them to the instruct to the students. So the idea we really started exploring is okay, how can we then more appropriately support our students? And we started thinking more from the point of view of the psychological angle and say students have to make decisions about their learning. We don't have to deal with the entire process of decision making for the student, but for the decision making process that is affecting the way they interact in the learning experience. The field of psychology has produced a lot of literature and has explained and has proposed a lot of theories to try to understand how do we make decisions, how do we make good choices. And one of them states that in order to, to make a good choice, what you need is mainly three elements. You need experience in that field, you need good information, and you get from feedback. If we apply or we translate this to a context of a student or a learner in a learning environment, having experience is probably something related to their own self-regulation. Having good information is probably something about the resources, but having prompt feedback is something that is easily to easy to identify as possible, not so easy to uh, execute. And this is basically what we were exploring. Can we provide prompt feedback at scale for courses that have a large number of students? If you need it any more convincing about feedback, there are some expert uh, pedagogical researchers um, out there that claim not only feedback is important, in fact, they claim that if you don't provide feedback, learning is severely diminished. And therefore, we can work on, under these assumptions and say, all right, if we want to support our, our students, but at the same time we want to promote uh, high quality learning, perhaps feedback is a very good vehicle, or is a very good instrument to achieve that. So what we have to do now is work out the connections and see what are the possibilities to provide feedback in such a way that I can do it for large courses, let's say a thousand students. Now the issue of feedback is fascinating because as with the case of decision making in the area of psychology, the issue of it or the, the area of feedback in education has been also very deeply studied. And interestingly enough, it, it has been characterized as challenging and full of um, suggestions and full of uh, caveats as well. And therefore, it's a bit challenging to think in terms of how to provide effective and positive feedback to students. A long time ago, around 2008, Danny Liu, uh, currently at the University of Sydney, started exploring this idea and started with the concept of just sending the students personalized messages, messages that reflected different pieces of text or included different uh, portions of suggestions, depending on the type of results or the type of data that we were obtaining. And he went a long way trying to collect data that would inform those type of decision making. In the, left, in the left side of the screen, what you see is a screen capture of his initial platform, SRS, which is still working. And uh, what he did was to combine the availability of this data with a specific or a special editor that will allow you to tell you, see this paragraph here? It should disappear if the student has done this, or it should appear if the student hasn't done this. And but in this part of the text, I would like to include the name of the student, or I would like to include the score of some things like that. Those were some um, initial uh, steps that we were taking. Back in 2015, I think it was, we put together a proposal, a research proposal, to deploy a project that would take this idea, re-implement it, and start exploring it more in the context of learning analytics, and try to see if we can connect it with additional data sets, explore also the difficulties of getting this data, and see what are the possibilities for institutional adoption. 
So we set ourselves a few goals and we acknowledged that uh, we needed to have a platform that had a direct connection with the data. The data had to be there. It also had to be intuitive for academics. It has to be something easy. They have to have some immediate sense of purpose. In other words, the academics, which was the case for the SRAS platform that I just mentioned, they immediately identified, oh, I can talk to my students, I can send an email, I can send a reminder that is personalized based on what they've done so far. This is interesting. We also wanted to solve a clearly identified pedagogical problem. In this case, it would be sending effective personalized feedback messages to students. We were aware of the wealth of data sources that are available, and we wanted to make a platform that was agnostic with respect to the elements. In other words, it was a member of the existing ecosystem. We wanted to then explore a little bit more and support human and machine integration. Not only humans or instructors can manipulate those emails, but perhaps those emails can be crafted based on the results provided by sophisticated predictive algorithms and also make it very extensible. So these were the premises, and we started thinking, and we came up with this architecture and a tool that I'm going to describe now more in detail. And we call it on task. This is a first uh, characterization of what we're trying to do. At the center of this picture, you see what we call a table. And this is a regular table with the student information that most instructors that we have talked to, they already keep either on the LMS or on their own computers. This is a typical table where you annotate assessments or sometimes observations. And sometimes some academics or some instructors, they want to uh, annotate the class attendance. What we are providing is what you see on the left and on the right, the possibility of connecting that table directly with text, with emails, with actions in general. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more what I mean by actions. In these actions, the key issue is that they're going to be different for different students. And those differences will depend on the data that is in that table. So let me give you a very quick and uh, rapid overview of what the platform is offering. And we are going to run all these from the point of view of the instructor. So I want to ask you to pretend that you are an instructor. You have a large number of students in a course, and you would like to send different emails at different points in the course, reminding them or providing them with suggestions. But you want to account for the difference between these students. And those differences will be taken based on the data we have available. OK? All right, so first concept of the platform. The instructions will manipulate a set of workflows. We struggle quite a lot with how to call this entity. It would be a course. It would be a, some, some countries call it a paper. Some countries call it a subject. Um, we decided to call it a, a workflow because there are certain steps that get involved in that process. But from your point of view, you think a, a workflow would be a course. And the only thing it has is two elements. It's a data table, which is what we, we had seen, um, as students in the rows, and then columns with different variables, and a set of actions. And these are the actions that can be personalized. So I'm going to give you a very quick review now on that. This is the first um, page that you will encounter when you log in. Of course, you will not have exactly these six workflows you see in there. So these are my courses, or these are my subjects that I work with. Each one of them is captured in a workflow. So the first page you see is the workflows you have available. You also see up there on the right-hand side of the page that uh, we also have an administrative uh, tab, and this is for only specific users. So a regular instructor wouldn't see the full functional administrative pages because they take care of a lot of things. And this is kind of like the technology, technological stuff. But I'm going to give a very brief overview a little bit farther down the road. Main idea here is that when you enter the platform, there is your collection of work workflows for you to uh, start working. So what do you do next? You choose one and open it. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a glimpse of how they are created a little bit farther down the road. But let's assume that you have this work. Let's and open it. When you open the workflow, if you look at the top of your screen, you'll see that um, it tells you that you are manipulating some specific workflow. So from now on, all the operations and all the uh, changes that you see here are applied to a specific workflow. If you want to go to another workflow, you have to close this one by clicking on the upper left corner and then select another one from that home page. So we're working with this workflow. First thing we see, we have additional operations in there. We have a menu that says actions, another menu that says table, and then some additional things. So this goes back to my initial comment that uh, a workflow is simply a table, a data table, and a set of actions. So these are the actions that are already created. 
And I know this is already a sophisticated workflow, but bear with me for a second. I'll tell you a little bit about how to create these uh, actions. So these are the actions that are available. We have different type of actions. And those different types, the ones that are correct, uh, correctly currently supported, sorry, are a personalized text, which you can think of as a personalized email. Well, I'll show you how to use it in different ways. Personalized Canvas email. We can also send email to the Canvas platform using its API as an API integration. We can send a personalized JSON to another machine, or we can run basic surveys. And the column in the left hand side tells you exactly the type of actions you have there. So this workflow here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven actions. If you go to the table, this is a conventional, typical table that you would see in your uh, Excel or similar application. It's just that it's inside all tasks, and it has some specific operations at the top. Of course, you need to have the ability to add or remove columns or rows, and this is something you do with those menus up there. You also have, um, for those columns, different data types, and these are the four ones we are supporting, supporting correctly, string, number, boolean, and data. You also can manage large table by just creating a subset of it or viewing only a portion. And this is what this menu on top that says view. So this is for tables like this one that has, I think, 64 columns. And it's a little bit unmanageable. It's a little bit too complex. But it's not a problem to just go there with that menu, create a view. And the view allows you to select certain rows and columns. And if not, and, and either visualize the entire table or one of its views. The two options you see in the center is for the exploration. We have some basic uh, statistical uh, renderings and, and visualizations just for the instructor to quickly take a look at how the tables or how the columns in the table contain the information and things like mean, average, first quartile, third quartile, maximum, minimum, histograms, and box plots are the ones we show. This table also is suitable to be downloaded as a CSV in case you want to manipulate them outside. And we have some additional uh, operations here, which are the ones you would use if you want to create your workflow from scratch. If you start in on task and you don't have any workflow, the first step you will do is create a workflow. It will be an empty workflow. We do it have an empty set of actions and an empty table. And the first step would be, as you see there, upload and merge the data from the table. These are the sources that we are currently supporting to upload the data to the platform, five of them. Uh, we go from simple CSV files, Excel files, which are very similar to CSV, um, a Google Sheet, which is yet another format we store, again, the same table. And we also support the um, reading files that are stored in Amazon uh, S3 buckets, because we've seen that some scenarios require data that is available in that platform. And perhaps the most powerful one you should be able, if it's properly configured, to run a query in a remote database, and the table that is returned becomes automatically your work table. Now, handling tables in this context is not trivial. And this is something that in some institutions, they decided to hide away from the instructors. In other words, they provide instructors with enough support so that this table is already populated. And they never have to deal with these operations. But if they have to, managing this table is not a trivial task, specifically or especially when you have one table and you want to merge your content with another new table. And this is the case when data, is, when data keeps coming. In that case, what you have to do is to perform a merge operation. And this is one of the sophisticated corners of the tool. But it allows you, if you want to, to take an existing table and incorporate additional columns, additional rows, and you have to provide some specific information so that the merging operation can be done. This is also the type of uh, operations that, that are done fairly uh, frequently in data analysis procedures. It's just that this one in particular, to incorporate additional data in an existing table, is the one we chose to include in our task. All right, so this wraps up the outer layer of complexity. Um, if, if, we, if, I, if you let me recap, on task is basically offering you to manage a set of workflows, which is a course, it is something else. But those workflows, the important things, you have a data table and a set of actions. All right, let's focus now on the block of my talk on the actions. Actions are interaction with learners. We're going to exchange things with our learners. And some of these elements in the in these interactions are included or excluded based on a per learner condition. And this is our way of distributing these um, 
these actions to uh, a large number of students. The typical example is an email that will have different paragraphs depending on the context of the learner. So different students will receive different messages. This is something that um, I've heard quite a lot of from uh, some people that say, okay, so this is similar to mail merge. And it is indeed. What we're doing here is a mail merge taking a little bit uh, to a different context and, and it, with more sophisticated options. We do have a list of the students. We do have uh, several attributes for each student. And we are offering the possibility of crafting this email, or rather this email template, I'll show you in a second, that will allow us to do that. Okay, so let's revisit in our workflow the table um, of actions. These are the actions that are available. Let's focus on this one. This one is already created. Again, I'm showing you something that has already been created, but I'm going to walk you through the elements, and hopefully you'll see how these things can be created in your own context. So this action that, action that we see here, it's a personalized text, and it's basically a message to remind those students that haven't visited the forum to do so. So this is a, an action that you would like to take identical message to all the students, but only those that haven't accessed the forum. It's a simple action, it's not exactly a personalized email, but I'll walk you um, gradually through this level of complexity and then we'll introduce additional personalization. So this is what the editor is offering you. It's a basic editor that allows you to insert column values and insert what we call attributes, which are simply um, abbreviations for other names. And this is useful in case you want to give this work to somebody else and then this template would have to change. You just adjust the value of the attribute and the coordinator name can be changed. So what you have in front of you, it's an email that has very small elements for personalization. It basically says, hello, John, or dear John, or dear Sarah, depending on the student name. So far, so good. The powerful thing here is that you would like to pick all the learners as the one that will receive that email. So this email is specific to remind them to connect to the, um, or to use the discussion forum, but you would like to select only some of them. Which one? The ones that the data tells you that should be receiving that email. So this is why we offer here in this second tab what we call a filter. So let me show you exactly what the filter does. This is the filter that says that there are certain students that haven't connected to the discussion forum yet. This filter has already been created. The purpose is to select the subset of the students for which this email applies, and the rest will not be included. Now, if we open the filter, this is basically at the heart of our task. This is what we call a condition or a rule. And it says that those students that have connected to the discussion forum are the ones for which the column with name days online has a value that is less or equal to seven. Okay? So this is basically assuming that we have such a column and assuming that if the number of online days is less than seven, we can make the assumption that they haven't used the forum discussion much and therefore, we're going to send these students an email. So what we're doing here, this is very important, we're using the data to select those learners, or rather to define a condition that will identify those learners for which this email will be sent. OK, so next, let's do a different action. Let me show you how an action is created from scratch, a more sophisticated one. So a one that not only has the same text for everyone, just changing the name, but it has different bits and pieces for different students. So the first thing we would do is click on that button and create a new action. And we would have a trivial, um, a trivial uh, menu that tells us what is your um, new action and what type of action would you like to create. In this case, it's a personalized text. Now, let me give you uh, the context of this example. We have a very large cohort, and it turns out that our students are actually enrolled in four different programs or degrees. Let's say, for example, it's a basic science course, and that basic science course, or math course, and it's taken by engineers, it's taken by pharmacists, it's taken by biologists, it's taken by engineers, you know, uh, different people from different programs. We would like to talk to them. We would like to give them advice. But that advice should be different depending on the program they are involved. So this is the scenario. So we create the um, action. What we're going to assume is that our data has one column that tells us precisely which program each student is involved in. Now, the first very important element, we look at the filter before. Now we need to look at the, what we call the text conditions. And these are the conditions that are going to control if text appears or not. So we click on that tab. The editor will allow us to create a new condition. And this condition, assuming that we have a column that is called program, and assuming that that column has four different values, this one is FASS, 
which it's an acronym for a program in some institution. What we are going to write is a condition that will select or will be true, will be satisfied when the student enrolled in that program. Now what we're going to do is create four of these. So we create one condition for each of the four programs. And those are the values you see on the screen, FASS, FEIT, FSCI, and EB. Again, this is something, I'm making a lot of assumptions here, this is something that is already coming to you, it's already part of your table, it's already in a column, and that column is available for you to write this condition. So this condition is true. Get students enrolling fast, and we would create four of them. These are the four conditions that have already been created. As you can see, each condition shows its formula. We have the first one we created in the top left corner, and we have the other remaining three. On task also tells you how many of those students satisfy that formula. So in my cohort of 500 students, they are distributed as you see in the four programs: 124 in the first one, 126 in the second, 129 in the third, and 129 in the School of Medicine, SMED. And the formula, as you see, is consistent. Let's look at SMED. It says students in SMED. The formula is program is equal to SMED and not empty, because if the program has an empty value, then it won't qualify. I hope this makes sense because this is where everything gets together. Now we go back to the editor. We have four conditions in there and a new menu appears at the top. One that allows us to use the condition in highlighted text. So this is what we do. We write the text and we can insert some column name. We still greet our students based on their name. We can even include a paragraph that are for learners. You see that paragraph has no marking, nothing. But then what we're going to do is include a paragraph, select it and highlight it, and this you use the button of that that use condition in highlighted text, and we'll end up creating, it'll end up introducing or surrounding our text with those marks you see there. You see the 30 grades percentage sign that says it's student fast. So this is the markup, or this is a special mark in the text that all tasks adds when you select the, the text and you say, I like this text to appear based on condition the student is in fact. <laughs> so as you can see, what we have here is four paragraphs. Each one of them appear depending on one of the conditions. So another way to look at this text, this text is no longer an email. This text is an email template. And this email template has elements that appear or disappear. And for each student, may have a different type of uh, template because they may, sorry, a different type of message because they may be enrolled in a different program. The other interesting thing to look at this is that even though I have five paragraphs in there, each message that will go out will only contain two paragraphs. One saying welcome and the other one giving specific suggestions or advice or tips or techniques for each one of the programs. <laughs> now the important thing is that since we're handling these templates, we need to be able to visualize them. And this is what is provided by this functionality that you're seeing. <coughs> We would like to see the final appearance of this message. And we click in there, we see that for this user, 1.500, um, the, the username of the student name is Alika. For Alika, we're going to select whatever is uh, we decided to provide as suggestions for those students who go in fact in fast in the fast program. And with these arrows in here, you can cycle over the personalized messages. Some of you might be thinking, if instead of 500 students I have 1,000, I'm not going to review 1,000 emails. And that is correct. This is just for your convenience. If you have time, the platform will cycle through them. But this is basically um, something we included because in our pilots, the academics told us that they needed a sense of um, assurance of what was going to be uh, sent to the students. Um, the other should that not showing, but the platform tells you it has a little bit of intelligence to detect certain conditions that are not satisfied by any students, or certain students for which all the conditions are false. And those are kind of like very good leads to detect anomalies and to perhaps refine your conditions and prevent you from sending empty emails that say, hello, welcome to the course, and then nothing else because this student has an empty value, things like that. Those things would be picked up by the platform and flagged as potential errors. And this screen you're seeing here will guide you directly to those anomalies to, to preview them. The other interesting element is that at the bottom you have the values that have determined the, the, the structure of this email. 
So if you see an email that is not supposed to be with this structure, at the bottom you'll have all the values from here and you can go back to your conditions and say, oh, okay, yeah, this condition should be redefined because it's not selecting the right type of the structure for the emails I have now. What do you do afterwards once you created this uh, action or this email? Once you review the template and you feel comfortable, then you can send it. You provide certain additional information. You need to give the tool um, the column that has the email address, because otherwise it's difficult to, it might be difficult to interpret. Um, you have the possibility of sending CC emails, PCC emails, and then a few additional um, options there at the bottom. Perhaps one that is worth noticing, noting is the one, the last one that says download a snapshot of the workflow. And this is very useful because you can send those emails, you store the workflow outside the bottom task. And then if you want to go back and say, gee, I wonder what kind of email did I send out a student that day, then you can upload that snapshot as, an, as another separate workflow and review those things. And this is something that the operations of the workflows allows you to import and export. All right, that concludes block number two. Block number three, now let's take this a little bit outside of the context of an email. And let's make it a bit more generic. One of the things we discovered very quickly in the project is email is just one way of communicating. But there are some other ways and there are some other um, additional elements of that communication that can be applied under the same premise I just discussed. Personalize certain elements and do that at scale. So let me show you an example. Let's look, go back to our uh, sample um, workflow and now let's focus on that action there that is called badges. It's a very intuitive one. If we open the editor, we have a very simple document there that has three images, and those images are controlled by certain conditions. So you see where this thing is going, right? This is a very simple and intuitive idea. I have certain indicators that tell me what the students did, and I would like to basically show in their uh, bronze, silver, or gold medal, depending on the level of engagement, or if nothing has happened, some brief method that says work in progress. And this is precisely what this thing is showing. It's just that uh, I finished the editing and I finished the creation of the conditions. The conditions are very similar in the spirit to the ones we saw in the previous example. It's basically detecting four different levels of achievement, if you will, or four different levels for which you would like to uh, distinguish them with different badges. And these images are just trivial badges we chose just to showcase this example. This is a very simple personalized message, right? And we can also apply the preview mechanism and see out of all the users, not only the type of batch that will be shown, but also the value that has, uh, that has prompted that, the selection of that uh, image. Perhaps another way to take a look at it, even though you see that template that has three images in a text, then for each student, the conditions will be properly evaluated, those values then will end up selecting the proper image. So again, this is a, person, a very quick and easy way to do a personalized batch page. And you can complicate that as much as possible with several batches, or even with um, batches and messages to obtain the next batch. The main key idea is that once you start working with these templates, you can very quickly incorporate additional functionality and you can scale it automatically to a large number of students. Now here's the catch though. This is not exactly something you would send by email, right? This is something that perhaps you would like to make available through a URL and that URL uh, included in somewhere in your learning management system. And this is something that OnTask anticipated as well as another way of uh, providing student support and allows you to do that. So basically, we can go to the uh, options of that action, of the action badges, and we would like to make the personalized content now available to the learner. And what that means, that option is basically a URL. It's a URL that you as an instructor, you can copy and put directly anywhere you want in your course. So the final appearance of this would be in the learning management system. Remember that on task is LMS agnostic, you would say, would you like to check your uh, set of badges for this course? Click in this link. Now, the reason why you see there is an asterisk at the end of that sentence is, is because in order for that to work smoothly, on task needs to be tightly integrated with your institutional systems. And what I mean by tightly integrated is basically managing the credentials. And managing the credential means the users have to have access to on task, and they would enter by the users, I mean the learners, they would enter as learners, and they would have then to uh, have an account in there. 
Now, the way we address this is OnTask provides LTI integration. So it's, it works like any other uh, producer of information for learning management systems. I don't know if you have experience with your LMSs um, connecting to LTI. I'm sure you do. And it's basically OnTask sits in a server waiting for requests. And as soon as we receive a request that comes from your specific LMS with some specific secrets encoded in the request, we identify a legal and authorized one, create an account, and serve that personal URL to the student. So the student would end up seeing the dashboard, not the dashboard, the set of badges, as you saw in the action. A third one, just, just uh, for you to have a sense of what is available, this uh, type of uh, action you see at the top of the table is the same thing, it's personalized messages. This is an email type of action, but it has a caveat or it has a specific feature which is that is used within the learning management system and the emails are sent through the internal Canvas inbox uh, manipulation. And this is a request that came uh, from one of the a couple of institutions that were involved in the project and the API, um, the Canvas API is used, and on task negotiates the OAuth the authentication in order for these emails to be sent as the instructor from the Canvas platform. It's another um, actual implementation that is being used now in the University of British Columbia um, and some other some other institutions that are using Canvas. Um, the action you see there, that other type, is sending a JSON to a remote server. For those of you that don't know, a JSON is basically a machine uh, package that contains certain data. So rather than to send that to a human, you end up sending that information to a machine. But that information is also personalized. It might be different from one to another. One potential uh, application of this automatic action would be either detecting certain students and sending the, their records to another uh, platform for further processing, or perhaps um, sending some information to a mobile app. That would be another possibility. And the mobile app server then would uh, push those, those notifications to the UMI application. So this is basically to give you a sense that um, within the project consortium, there was a, a lot of time devoted to think about potential scenarios and identifying the minimum uh, basic functionality needed to integrate them, and they are all present in on task and ready to be um, used. Final one, this is the type of uh, action that kind of closes the loop. Um, it is not only about instructors giving uh, to students information. In our conversations with instructors, we also find a very frequent scenario in which they wanted the students to first give them some information. So there's, this is something that is not new, and there are so many, um, so many survey and so many uh, yeah, type of uh, packages like uh, Google Forms or Qualtrics or similar, and they offer you gazillions of options to design your surveys. The problem we found is that then instructors end up struggling with moving the data back and forth. Yes, I run my survey, but it's in Qualtrics, it's not in the LMS, then I need to cross uh, the credentials in there with the ones in the LMS, and then I do some data cleaning, and then remapping, and then finally I can use the data. And this was uh, proven very, very painful for a lot of instructors. So what we decided in all task is to include a very basic uh, survey engine. Very basic meaning, this is the type of action you can create. It's basically questions that you can either uh, include a multiple choice answer or open text. The open text, though, it's very tricky to manipulate with the conditions, but it's something that you can still detect. But the multiple choice is a, it's a crucial one. So what you can do here is create these questions and then provide a URL to your students. The students answer this question. And the bonus comes at the end. The bonus is that whenever the students answer those questions, the data go back to your table in your workflow, in on task, ready for you then to be manipulated with other conditions in other contexts. All right, I know this is probably a lot of information very quickly, but uh, hang in there with me. Uh, we're going to cover some other aspects and some other features, um, and then we'll wrap it up and ask your questions. So this is technologically inclined. And for those of you that don't have a very uh, deep understanding of how technology works, now, I was waiting for the slide transition. Um, the only thing basically to uh, take 
It's always that all task is not a trivial platform. It's not a simple thing that you install and get running. It has quite a lot of uh, sophisticated bits and pieces, especially to integrate with the existing platforms in your institution. Um, the underlying technology, for those of you that are curious, is this uh, web design framework that is called Django, which itself is based on Python. And it has been a very interesting choice because during the project, we actually explored a lot of options. And actually, some of them crystallize as different platforms, all of them doing more or less the same idea. Um, but the, the choice of Python or Django is because Python is now growing uh, very strongly in the area of data analysis. And there are a lot of libraries, functionality, and other uh, bits and pieces that are very powerful to um, manipulate data. And this is the part that we've been using as part of our own task. There are some other things in there that are a bit more sophisticated because we need support for batch processing and load balancing and bits and pieces to make it scalable. But this is basically to convey to you that this is not a boilerplate type of application with a simple idea behind it. It's a sophisticated platform that does something very specific for the structures. And it's ready to be scaled. And it uses the state-of-the-art technology in web platforms. Just to give you an idea, this type of uh, web design architecture is behind platforms like Instagram or Dropbox or YouTube. Finally, um, additional things for those of you, again, te technologically uh, inclined that you were, might be wondering. We include as uh, part of the tool, and this is thanks to using the Django uh, framework, several authentication options, some of them using a SAML tool, LTI. Uh, we also tested some basic support for LDAP um, and some others that are a bit more sophisticated. Um, in order to send the emails uh, properly and for those emails not to end up being spam or end up being banned, it needs to connect to your own corporate SMTP server. Uh, sending email is not the responsibility of OnTask. OnTask needs to talk to your server, and then that server, the STP server that is handling your internal communications, is able to send those emails. Um, we have Zoom user authentication, or sorry, identification through email address, so whenever we receive uh, information with certain email address, we assume that that's the, the ID, the unique ID of the student. Like I mentioned, we include some queuing system for batch tasks um, because they are sometimes required. So, and we have a uh, university of Auckland sending one house and email, so that takes a little bit and it needs to be happen uh, asynchronously. Um, the platform offers very powerful infrastructure to um, manipulate the data inside it. And one of my favorite ones is that it allows you to execute scripts while the platform is running. And those could be some things, for example, to upload pre-created uh, actions or pre-created conditions to certain workflows for structure. So that's very powerful. It's used in PostgreSQL because that database is very, very tightly integrated with Django. We're very happy with the performance. And we also included, and again, we could, I could be talking for hours about the functionality of the platform. We also included the notion of a plugin, which is basically put in certain specific location in the platform your code, and that code will do a specific data transformation. Those are things like, for example, to implement linear models or some prediction of clustering that will return to you the categories, and then you would be able to reason with those categories in your design of the actions. This is all good, very interesting. I'm a techie, as you probably already figured out by now, and I'm passionate about it, but the bottom line is, does it work or not? And we ran a few experiments and a few studies about it. All of them have been published. Um, this is one that was run about uh, three years ago. Uh, the reference is not up to date because it has been published already. It's not, it's not in press anymore. So it's been published. And um, that experiment was uh, with a cohort of around 350, 400 students. It was run over two consecutive years. Um, and what we did is, we compare the answer to the question about the feedback being useful in the course from one year that we're not, we were not using on task to another year where we use on task a lot. Like 10 weeks out of 13, students will receive one email with suggestions. But we can jump to the answer uh, to that question, which by the way, remember, is the typical that gets the lowest uh, student valuation all over the world. There are even studies that uh, document how this question is poorly answered uh, in pretty much all the institutions. We saw a medium to positive effect of 0.49. Um, 
the effect on academic attainment, the effect on the midterm exam, we explored that and there was a slight increase, a small positive effect, but not as big as the satisfaction of the students. The students was, were very satisfied with this. In the second part of what we did is talk to them, not only uh, look at what they say regarding the feedback, talk to them and ask them in focus group what exactly uh, prompted you to do the email and what exactly were your feelings about it. And it were very, very powerful and positive reactions because most of them acknowledged that it helped them to keep things in perspective, to, to be aware of where they are. And some of them uh, directly identified them as a nudge, which is the, the main purpose. Um, another interesting thing that we identified with some of the students is the notion that sometimes it was a, a warning, but not only for the course, but for the entire semester. It's basically, oh, if I'm receiving these emails from this course that is telling me about all these things I should be doing that I'm not doing, maybe I should pick up my game, not just in this course, but in my studies in general. So we thought that was interesting. Uh, and also, it opened a fascinating area that we are now researching much more in depth about how do you frame those messages, what is the right tone, what are the right elements, how do you contextualize them, because they have to be very specific to the course. They cannot contain generic things like good work, keep working, or bad work, they start studying. It has to be much more specific, and we have some other uh, contributions, and I have some other talks that um, I can elaborate a bit more about how do we go about creating those messages. Finally, um, if you are more inter if you are interested, um, this is a little bit of the summary of what we've done so far. Uh, we intended to support instructors to manage this personalized feedback. It's a simple rule-based knowledge encoding, nothing sophisticated. We are going for breadth rather than depth here. We also provide basic view of the data sources. Um, the messages and the way they are written, they will be better written if there is good knowledge of the learning design. In other words, those messages have to be highly contextualized as part of the design. We tested it in large and highly diverse cohorts with positive results. This was a project that just ended last month, March 2019. I got a lot of inertia. Um, the two interesting things is that we managed to replicate the results. So those are results that replicate fairly consistently across institutions. We have already several conversations with multiple academics that tell us, oh, yes, we said to those emails in there, and they are so specific, and the students appreciate it a lot, so we get a lot of very good response for that. And then the other good news, in case you are interested, is that we do have the demo servers still available. Even though the project finished, we still have managed to support uh, the right resources, and those demo servers are available for anyone. Um, if you need a connection, <laughs> Means to, to, to tinker with the platform. The platform obviously doesn't send any emails, but as I've shown you so far, you can um, do pretty much everything except the final stage in which those emails get out to someone. All right, I think it was a lot of information. Uh, I cannot see the face of the audience, but I can imagine some of them will be already a little bit overwhelmed so early in the morning. But I wanted to leave a little bit of time, if possible, for questions or for any additional uh, comments you would like me to make. And again, very great, my pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm just going to relay, thank you so much. I'm going to relay some questions to you. Uh, any questions from Perfect. Yeah. Yes, one from Stephen. Thanks. I'm Lana. Can you expand on the project ending and the transition to an open source barrier project? Like what that transition looks like, what it means in practice? Um, so, Stephen is asking, could you please elaborate a bit on uh, the ending of the project and its transition to an um, Ethereum um, open source project and what it all entails? Yes, we've been very fortunate to connect with Ian Dolphin and to be uh, accepted in the Aperio uh, incubation process. And we've been making very good progress throughout the, the stages, and I think we are very close to uh, finish the incubation project, uh, process. The tool is already available as open source. Uh, we've been very careful uh, selecting licenses that were generous in the terms of the use that is available. And um, we already are articulating a community around the tool. That community has members from 
quite a lot of uh, institutions, um, some of them in Australia, but we have uh, a few folks from all over the world. We have uh, interest in the United States, some institutions in there, UT Arlington, um, interest in the University of British Columbia, very strong adopter, uh, University of Adelaide, which is next door to where we are, and University of South Australia. Um, so we do have now a very strong community, and hopefully we will be able to capitalize and catalyze all these all these efforts and sustain the tool and keep it um, useful for the institutions. Thanks. Um, anybody else? No one. That's it. Uh, thank you so much um, for joining us, especially um, while you are on, on leave for Abelardu. We really appreciate it. Hope to meet you in person sometime in South Africa. So, um, <laughs> thanks so much. All right. Thank you very much. And greetings from Abelardu. Thank you. Firstly, want to thank Open Collab for this as well. Um, they help us a lot. They do did everything actually. <laughs> we just pay them. <laughs> um, okay, so this is.
This what happened in at un, uh, Northwest University. It's all the submissions from the assignment to uh, getting to the lecturer, and the need was arise that I really want to divide the submissions between markers. Um, at our university, at IT as well as at CTL, we do not have the capacity to organize uh, all of that markers and um, assure quality on a central-based uh, place. Um, so it needs to be in the lecturer's control, and he or she needs to administrate the markers and assure quality. It must be in a known environment, so that must be Sakai, or in our case, Ifundi, and it needs to be easy to use. So everybody is used to assignments. So, um, and we, we thought about LTI tool, but the assignment tool is so integrated with all of the other tools that it seems to be logical to just extend on that. So this is a typical course site. And in the site info, you would know that um, screen. Uh, we just add the row of marker that's actually stuck stock standard within Sakai. So in the lessons, oh, in the um, assignment tool, we add, oh, back. Um, we add another tab here, yeah, sorry, it's a bit small, but that's where the markers download and statistics will be. So that's the place where you can see um, the, the, f the progress the, the marker was um, doing the post uh, during the submissions. We also add in the permissions tab, we also add a new permission, so that marker role will need to have um, marker permission, and as well as all of the other roles, so you can use your teaching assistants also as markers. So within the, the setup of a new assignment, we oh. we add a new type of assignment that needs to be uploaded, or, uh, and that's the PDF only files because we want a online on-screen marking tool at the end, and that's in PDF. So the, the student needs to upload the PDF file and not, nothing else. So that needs to be set. And um, then we have this marking setup um, tick box. So if you tick on that, it would fold open and all the the users in the site that have the permission uh, and the role of marker and have the permission to mark your assignments will be listed here and you can set up a quota in percentage of who uh, of the uh, number of um, assignments or submissions that that marker needs to mark. So we did that and I've used two of my colleagues and I gave 90% to Adele and only me um, 10%, and I seems to be fair and square about that. I like my 10%, so Adele needs to do 90% of it. And um, the first submissions came in, and obviously Adele will get the one that was submitted. Um, <coughs> and a bit later, Adele gets eight, and I'm also getting one, so that seems fair. So um, I marked my one, and I uploaded it, so I can see in the, st the statistics that I've got the total. I marked one. Um, new submissions is the submissions that I haven't downloaded yet will be, will be counted there. Um, I can download all, or I can download also just a parcel download. Um, so I can download just the, the, the assignments I haven't seen or downloaded yet. Um, 
or I can, if the, the computer crashed or whatever, I can also download all of the submissions again if something happened. Um, this is just a screen that uh, you can see one of the submissions was uploaded. Um, here you can see it, and the marks was also allocated to the student. And then unfortunately, Adele resigned and she left the building. So I'm the lecturer and I only want 10% of this. So I get another colleague and I go into the assignment and I edit it and I said, okay, Harda, now you're going to do Adele's work. Thank you very much. And everybody is happy ever after because um, now Harda is having all of those um, submissions to mock that Adele didn't mock. Um, so now the only thing that's left for us to do is to, to build a, a on-screen marking app that will recite on the marker's desktop that um, he can mark on screen and upload these assignments back. And hopefully next year we will demo that. Thank you very much. a little bit better? Higher? Okay. <laughs> How's that? Good? Okay. Um, I think that's, um, so I'm Francia Campbell. Um, we've also done another development with Northwest um, with Adele and Silly. Uh, this is on the Lesson Builder tool in Sakai. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, it originally was developed for Sakai 10.5. It's since then been migrated to 11 and most recently to 12. The initial idea or the concept of the tool was just to speed up the uh, adoption of the Lesson Builder tool within the organizations. And um, what lecturers had um, described as a requirement was to import and ingest documents and the source material into the LMS um, without all of the headaches and pain of actually migrating all of that content manually. So what we will, um, so, and also for the exporting of lessons for offline consumption for the students. Um, it's done in it's done in, two diff in three different ways. One is to import the docx um, documents, and the other two requirements is to either export back out to docx or export to EPUB. Um, the dependencies, external dependencies are docx4j, uh, EPUB creator, HTML cleaner, and XML graphics. Um, the major rules of the importing of the documents, just to speed up the process, is to um, use the headings so H1s, H2s, H3s as um, creating structure for the documents. H1s would then be a, a subpage on the root level. Um, H2s would then be child or subpages, and H3, 4, um, it goes down to about five. Um, paragraph text and objects on pages, uh, multimedia objects uh, in Word are also brought in. Uh, it does support embedded objects. It must also support links from HTML as well as tables. Um, and then, as I mentioned, some of the features are just importing .docx files and then creating a lesson and sub and sub pages based on that, um, exporting over over a lesson to .docx and exporting to EPUB. So this is a quick look into the visual changes that had to occur. Um, you'll notice that the features are added in. So by default, we'll normally just get these options here. Um, these will then be the additional options that um, are presented. And um, so the first one is obviously the word. Um, second export, the second two are then the exports. Um, this is just a demo, a um, little bit of a look into what you will see if you do try and export the document to 
EPUB. Um, I'll quickly give a demo after this. Same thing for .docx. It's um, very, very simple in terms of the user interface. It doesn't do much additional work. Um, all of it is done in the back end. Um, and then just um, some available configurations that are also added in, um, just to give you more control. Um, it does have the ability to control the exported headings. So for example, if um, you've got a thousand lecturers and they each decide they want to style it differently, um, just to get some uniform control, once it is imported and a lesson and you export it, you can then control the font type, the font size um, of the, all of your headings. Um, the um, yeah, font type, font size, family, color, and a few other additional features. You can decide to embed your resources into your EPUBs. Um, so if you do embed video of a certain size or images of a certain size, that'll also go with you into the EPUB, as images will then go into the docx, um, but videos not. Those will then just appear as links to the LMS resources in the docx. Um, you can set the file size inclusion limits for both the EPUB and the docx um, for, for embedding of these resources. And on the, on the export, you can also determine whether you want to export with the same controls for structure. So for example, if you've got um, a, pay, a parent page, sub page, sub page, if you would like that also then to go into the EPUB, um, then it will create, um, the EPUB document will then be created with the same features. Um, or you can go um, straight in line, so it will just be one flowing column, single column of text in your EPUB. Okay, demo time, wish me luck. <laughs> so let me go out here. Okay, so this is just your plain Jane um, landing page of lessons. You would then go in, you'd see these features, you would select your Word document. Um, let's see, let's do the test doc just to be sure. It will import a document, it'll do its job. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Uh, it will then pop up on the left here. You will click on your list on your docx document, and your content will then be up. Um, so it does support. So in this manner, it has followed. Um, so these are all your H1s, H2s. Um, you can you see? So the content supported. Let me go and just find a few others. Um, so some of the features will be it, it pulled in the images. Um, let's go down to the bottom. It supports your sub pages, so this is a sub sub page. Uh, it brings in some of your word art images that's in the documents and supports special characters. Uh, let me just bring in import another one. It's the little bit heavier document. So it has popped up on the left here. So this one does create a, a little bit of a heavier document. If you go in, it does also bring in some a lot of the content, some of the styling. Let's just go to another one. Um, so it also then brought in the table um, from the document itself, um, and then it imports it in. It does keep the structure, keep some of the styling colors, um, content, and as best as possible, it can also keep uh, fonts and, and all the, the information that comes in with the document. Um, so let's just quickly do an export. Uh, you have to be on the tool itself to perform the export on the root page. So you can export to your EPUB. Your EPUB then gets created and inserted into your resources tool, but you can also then download it from this section uh, by clicking on that, and then I'll, it'll pop up here at the bottom. Let me go to the resources. Oh, sorry, I'm clicking around too fast. On the resources, it'll, it'll appear at the bottom as a new resource. What is the time? 10.09. So the resources then immediately get added into the document. Um, this then allows the lecturer then to present it and to make it available to students. Um, or they can download it and take it offline. Um, the documents, let me go back quickly. The 
So that's the EPUB on Word. You can also then do the same. It follows the same process. It exports down to Word, to DocX. It will appear at the bottom and also go into the resources. Um, so the output. So I've just done a few. So um, on the one, this is a straight. This is when it is um, in structured content. Um, you'll notice that there's a lot less content. Um, it it'll follow. Um, section by section, so you'll have sub pages will be rendered as their own links. Um, if you decide to do it inline, inline it all flows as a single column, so all of your content then will go from page to page and it'll all just be in one stream. Um, yeah. So that is more or less the lesson builder enhancements. Um, any questions? Yeah, take in front and then I'll go over there. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, what I've seen the difference, um, I've seen the difference and what I want to know about is if you can split um, that import to create different sections. So instead of having other non, non, non text box to variate it um, and maybe also do some in the style to indicate where, um, you know, just a break. Yeah. So then it will also uh, include text to say, like, okay, now do the quiz and then maybe mainly in search and link to the quiz. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that I think we cater for with the uh, headings. So if you would go um, heading one, heading two, heading three, it will then create uh, heading one will then be your, your main page. Let me just see if I can uh, show you. Instead of a, a, another sub page, because we would rather have like less sub pages and more text sections in one. So like, so say it, when it imports, you have a, a, a sub page and then maybe one sub page within that, but in that sub page, rather than making uh, another sub page for activity. Just break a text box into another text box when you've done another heading or something. Do you follow that? Not sure. We have that on the, on this, uh, the previous EPUB um, creator that we used didn't cater for that. But I think we, we still have that on the, um, on the list of specifications for enhancements. You want to break it up in one in one um, page, but more than one text box. Yeah, I know of that that um, specification, but at the moment it's not working like that. You need to break it up in in word in headings. Yeah, and I think just uh, just to address the last point, there, if in the document you were also just adding. In so I think just to address that point as well, in the document itself, if you were to put in a block just to say this is where the assignment goes, that would also import there. So it's just a, it'll be a visual cue. It wouldn't be automated, but um, you you would break the doc. You would actually edit the document and re-import it. And if the lecturer is not quite happy with that, they can do the Word document themselves, split it up if they want to, um, and then just import that. So then it would create a lesson for each import. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yes, but if you import it, yeah, but I mean, um, once you start, you can uh, you can re-import the same document and recreate the tool, or you, you I think, yeah. yeah. So the, it's an interesting use case. I think you can get around it uh, with some workarounds in the document itself, but I don't think that's that's catered for at the moment. Okay. Um, I think first was over there. <laughs> No, no, no. You can, you can, you can do everything in in um, in lessons, and if you export it to EPUB, yeah, that's what I mean. in, the in the export to, to EPUB, all PDF files, video files, audio files, and um, uh, picture files will be embedded in the EPUB, but I'm not. not I'm 
okay, then the link will also go, the link is there. Um, so in the EPUB, then when, he, when he's offline and he click on the link, then obviously he needs to go online to, to submit the... No. <laughs> Yes, we. Yes, we're going to use those, but we. Re no, 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 no. We're not going to start over. We really want to take that out of of the PDF reader, not the PDF um, um, scenario that you still need the PDF to mark on it. But in our case, we had some troubles with PDF reader and PDF Pro because when they upgraded, and that's happen automatically on our campus, then the PDF marker tools, the tools for the marker um, doesn't work anymore. So, yes, so we need to get out of Adobe there. So that's that's the main thing. And we also want um, a kind of a manager app on the desktop because the users struggle with zip files. When they uh, re-zip, they on the wrong folder or whatever, and they can't get it through. So we want a, a, a manager app that you import the zip that's from Sakai, and then it seems like extracting in that manager app, and then you click on this, the submission, and the, you it opens this on-screen marking application, and you mark, and the marks get back to that manager app then, and from there, the app actually zips the fall and to be uploaded so something like that It's done on the fly. Um, it could theoretically be scheduled, but I think we were just giving the, the tool back into the lecturer's hands because we wanted to shorten that period of time where the lecturer is waiting on anything. And I think it's really for adoption. Um, the different institutions do adopt different tools in, in various ways and times. So just to speed up um, that process, we try to make everything as real time as possible. Um, it's built into the lesson builder tool, um, so it does run via that. It's also an endpoint, but it's um, the lesson builder tool is quite complex, so not all of those endpoints are exposed yet. For exporting, definitely there are some f there are um, flags on all of them to determine how it get ex gets exported. You can set it to the body text, you can set it to the headings, um, images, those sort of things. I think to all the headings specifically, because um, those are quite the, those are the ones that the lecturers normally change the most. So if you wanted to have an academic branding, you could do that. Um, the body text, of course, but um, I think that's as far as we went to with customization as a, on a uniform basis. The only downside of that is you, you turn it on either for the entire instance or, or for the entire instance. Um, also with Lesson Builder, I'm not sure if most people are aware of that, but there is also the ability to change the lessons using CSS that you upload. So per, s per lesson, you can include that. Uh, that also then gets taken across um, if it is included. Okay, perfect. Any further questions? Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you, Celia, and thanks, Thank Northwest. You, oh, sorry. <laughs> It works if you use heading one, two, and three, and it will, it will work. But at our university, we have this templates for study guides. And um, there we set up a template for, for this in particular. So just one, one final consideration. I think this is using Doc docx 4 j and as uh, Stefan also mentioned yesterday, um, I think when we initially did the development of 10.5, a lot of these um, document processes have changed. I think uh, Google Sheets has come along, uh, Office 360 in that time. So the the styling and those sort of things do 
have changed dramatically. And um, to keep up with it is actually why I think we wanted to just display it at this stage so we could get support for maintaining it as well. Um, it is all of these standards do change quite rapidly, so keeping up with that is, is a little bit of a challenge. So if anyone is interested, um, please reach out. That will always good, be good to merge resources. And I think, does that answer your question? Okay. So So whatever the source material has is what will be inserted into Lesson Builder. Um, Lesson Builder will try its best um, to make sure that it is co uh, that it is within the bounds of Lesson Builder, but again the source contact dictates. Yeah, but if I'm looking at it on my phone, I don't want to click on the folder. Yeah, no, it, it will interfere with that if the lecturer decides. I think the the reason we followed that was to give the lecturers confidence that what they do in Word will appear in Lesson Builder. So. I think um, it's a very good point. I think for us it was uh, really just to mirror the input and output, but I'm um, hearing uh, what you're saying. I think um, on the mobile side, the consideration there was to move it to EPUB, um, and EPUB would then handle all of the, the referencing, yeah? But again, your if you have a table, an actual HTML table in, in your document, or you have a table that goes into the lesson builder, it will then export a table, and tables are notoriously bad for responsive design. So I think that comes down to educating your users. Um, so there is no, we're not trying to enforce those standards, we're trying as best as we can just to get that flow, and as, as lecturers then learn the new ways, it's again easy for them just to say, okay, I've got all of this in Word, let me dump that lesson, import, the new document with the proper standards, with the proper, um, I think in Afrikaans they call it content versorging, uh, the instructional design, um, have all that in place, uh, and then it, the workflow just becomes a lot faster. I think it removes a lot of that editing concern because a lot of uh, lecturers are also very, I don't want to say tech phobia, uh, but they, they're not too comfortable with the online tools. And um, I think what Northwest the idea was they, they are comfortable with the word processes, give that to them and then just speed up the flow. So they can do the version control, um, well not proper version control, but they can um, innovate quickly and get their content back in. But it's a very valid point. I think we do need to look into that responsive design. And if Eunice is interested, then I think we'll get the funding for that and uh, all will be good. Um, yeah. Um, Silly, any thoughts on that? No, I'm, I'm good, thanks, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Okie dokie, any final thoughts or questions? No? Thanks so much.